Thank you, Ed. So, good morning, everyone. There's a very bright light on my eyes, so I'll, it's nice to not see everyone in front. So, uh, I hope you're enjoying yourself and getting helped by our blue shirts and ask, ask me. And now I would like to invite uh, our next keynote speaker, uh, Jay Alexander. He is a Senior Vice President and CTO of Keysight Technology. And uh, I spoke this morning, and he has been an uh, IEEE member from 1984. And he's a senior member also. So I had to say that first, because we are very proud to have our IEEE senior members here. Uh, he's uh, been with Keysight, I'm trying to see how long. 29 years, because I was trying to add up all the years here to see if I was correct there. And he's leading uh, the centralized planning and technology development team to focus on top opportunity and market trends to address the unmet needs. So, Jay, the floor is all yours. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Thanks very much and good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be here among so many of the uh, world's innovators in communications technologies. I do hope the conference is going well for you uh, thus far. It's still early in the week, but I've been very impressed by all of the activities that are already uh, happening. Now, I think at least uh, some of you have seen this quote here from Lord Kelvin. This is on the nature of measurement and it actually dates back to 1883. This is actually what my company is in the business of doing. We help to measure and simulate complex technologies so that we can say we know something about them. And when we think about a development like 5G, there is no shortage of constituent enabling technology that requires knowing something about. Now, before I delve deeper into that, I think it's also worth uh, knowing something about a key site. A key site is actually a platinum sponsor of Globecom, uh, but our name may not be familiar to all of you. And so in the spirit of uh, Lord Kelvin, I thought I would share some numbers uh, to help build up our understanding of key site. Uh, one number is that Keysight is a $3 billion revenue company. We have 10,000 employees around the world, and we operate in over 100 countries around the world. Now, our name is only a year or so old. And so another number that I want to share is the number 75, because 75 represents the number of years of experience we have in this business. It turns out that Keysight uh, traces its origins all the way back to 1939, to a garage in Palo Alto, California, where Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard first established their partnership. They created a first product, the Model 200A audio oscillator, and then hundreds and thousands of products in the years to follow. That garage is still there in Palo Alto. Today there's a sign out front that marks it as the birthplace of Silicon Valley. And so Keysight's roots run very deep indeed uh, in this industry. The team that has become Keysight today ran as Hewlett Packard for 60 years. And then in 1999, as Hewlett Packard had become a computer company, we were spun out as part of another company called Agilent Technologies. And probably you have heard it Agilent at some point or another. As part of Agilent, the electronic measurement business that is now Keysight supported the growth of Agilent's life sciences business, its chemical analysis business, its semiconductor business, we helped grow that company into a $7 billion company. We also divested companies like the company that became Avago. 
focused on semiconductor components, many of which went into the mobile uh, industry. And then after 15 years of running in that configuration, Keysight in turn separated from Agilent to focus 110% on electronic design and test. And that was just in November of 2014, just over one year ago. And so this is why our name is a new name, perhaps, on the scene for many of you. I can tell you today that from our CEO, Ron Nersessian, on down through the entire 10,000 member strong company, we are over the top excited about being able to focus on our core markets of electronic design and test. And within that core, the communications market is at the very core of the core. And so today, uh, as Keysight, we offer a broad array of design simulation tools, of software packages, application-specific software, many different hardware solutions, crossing benchtop, handheld, modular form factors, including AXIE and PXI formats, and a wide array of services. We have market leadership in comms-oriented EDA, and in important product categories like network analysis, signal analysis, and signal generation. And so we are positioned very well indeed to continue to advance many new complex technologies, including all of the technologies that will find their way into 5G mobile communications. So with those numbers having been shared in that background, now I hope we can say that we know something about a key site. And with that, I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, talking about 2025. Now, many of you have seen visions of what the future uh, communications environment uh, will look like. Uh, Matt shared a bunch of this information as well. Uh, we imagine a future that's very richly connected, where we have high connectivity at our workplaces, to our homes, on the road, to our families, our friends, our hobbies, uh, very densely connected, whether we're uh, using a fixed uh, platform, whether we're on the go, whether we're using a wearable device, or perhaps even an a body embedded device of some sort. We can foresee that there will be use models and applications that we can't actually imagine today. They might be as different from what we experience today as what we experience today is different from what we knew 10 years ago. And to put that in perspective, uh, some of us can remember that it was not even 10 years ago when we were so excited about the edge-powered devices that we were carrying around with us and how much more capability those mobile phones had compared to their predecessors. Now that's the magnitude of change that we can foresee, even if we can't foresee all of the details. Continuing to build out this picture, as Matt described, there will be all kinds of new medical applications, health and fitness and lifestyle-oriented applications, a build-out of smart homes, smart buildings, smart cities, many, many more devices connected to networks in one way or another. In fact, I believe the norm will actually shift to where connectivity is actually assumed for a wide array of devices rather than somehow being a special state of affairs as it often is uh, today. And then users in this environment will increasingly uh, not have to worry about the specific technology they're using. They're going to be focused on their experience, whether they're using Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G, or some other a variant or new technology that comes on the scene, they're going to be focused on, on their experience. And that's great. But of course, it falls to all of us in this room and our colleagues around the world to, in fact, uh, create those new technologies. And the role of companies like Keysight in the ecosystem is to support 
the ongoing innovation that allows those technologies to be created, to be validated, to be deployed uh, in volume. And so we are already working to anticipate uh, what that is going to take. As uh, many of us do, we talk to customers. Customers are already giving us clues about what's going to be required. One of the things customers are telling us is that their environments are incredibly complex and the competitive dynamic is just ruthless, even more than it's been in recent years. Uh, one, one of our customers used the word frantic to describe the race to deploy a new technology ahead of the competition in order to realize the potential to shift market share that often comes when you're able to do that. And so in the face of 24-7 global competition, disruptions to established business models, and all of the other uh, competitive dynamics, it is a very uh, frenetic and dynamic environment indeed. And then that has implications on what design and measurement companies like Keysight have to do to play our role in the system. But what we're being told is that our solutions have to be much more turnkey, deliver much more value right out of the box. They have to be built on flexible software platforms that are open. Our offerings have to include service offerings so that customers can focus on what to them is the core and achieve their competitive advantage while they outsource everything that for them is context. And so this kind of feedback is very much part of the landscape that Keysight and other companies in our space are facing as we look forward. And then as we deploy a new products and solutions that reflects this kind of feedback, what do we think that environment looks like? Well, as we envision the a communications development lab that is going to be working to enable that 2025 vision to come true, uh, we see a picture of distributed teams. So today we often have teams that are sitting in a fixed location, maybe interacting with a piece of measurement equipment and a given device under test. Of course, that will continue uh, in many ways in the future, but there will also be a diverse a geographically separated teams, especially when you think about the technologies going into 5G, the sizes of the companies that are working on many of these developments, the nature of their uh, development footprint around the world. We envision a design and test environment that has to be collaborative across multiple sites. The instruments have to incorporate data that may come from component level testing, subsystem level testing, even parts of networks or trial deployments that are being lit up, and all of that information has to be integrated to assess whether or not the performance is as it is intended to be. And so this is gonna require a lot more software, in our view, software that can pull together that data, software that can allow the developers to exchange physical uh, objects under test with virtual or simulated objects under test as part of evolving their designs and part of getting a read on how their designs are going to perform even before they've been rendered into silicon or into fiberglass or into any other end product form. We actually envision being able to take measurement IP such as what we produce and virtualize that so that you can exchange the physical hardware-oriented measurements with emulated measurements in this overall design and test environment, again, as part of optimizing the overall system. And so this is part of what we are working today uh, to create, and I want to spend a little uh, time on some of these uh, elements. Uh, to do that, I'm going to organize it the way we think of solutions which is hardware plus software plus people. This is not the only way uh, to organize it, of course, but this is a way that's proven very effective 
uh, for us and for our customers. We can start with the hardware element. Now, uh, clearly hardware in the mobile environment has changed dramatically over the past uh, 30 years. We can think back to the 1980s and those first systems. Think back to the first mobile phones. They were quite large and clunky. Uh, we called them bricks. Some of them were actually larger than the one I've depicted here. If we took one of those devices apart, what we would see inside is that the space was dominated by the systems associated with the keyboard, with the radio, and especially with the battery. And then uh, from a test standpoint, the test was really focused on ensuring the radio operation, both from a regulatory standpoint and from a performance standpoint. Out at the cell sites, we had equipment that required regular maintenance. The maintenance had to be done in person at the site, oftentimes by a technician, oftentimes in the middle of the night when the traffic was low and the uh, ability to uh, get that work done without disrupting the network further uh, was minimized. And then, you know, the way the network was viewed at that time, the, the mental model was the network was a wireline network fundamentally with a modest mobility overlay and then a radio interface to serve up the last kilometer of the link. And then from a test uh, standpoint, the testing of these systems was quite complex. It involved a lot of manual adjustments, a lot of manual calibration steps, racks and racks of equipment, such as I've shown uh, here. It was very time, uh, time, uh, time consumptive, consumed a lot of power, a lot of space. Now, this is an R&D setup that I've shown here. But even after these systems uh, were optimized and taken into manufacturing, they were still very cumbersome, very expensive, very large. It was not a particularly elegant way uh, to validate these systems, but it, it in fact was what was used to enable that first generation or two of the mobile environment. Clearly things in the world of hardware are much different uh, today. When we look at the devices themselves, uh, most of them no longer have uh, physical keyboards. Interestingly enough, uh, the batteries are still large consumers of the space inside the devices because despite the improvements in energy storage density that have been obtained, the demand for more power and more performance uh, continues unabated. And while the radio elements have actually gotten smaller, uh, the digital elements in the compute subsystem inside these products has grown much larger. And this is because now the products are being used fully as mobile computing platforms in addition to their role as, as communication devices. On the network side, uh, the equipment in some ways has grown uh, smaller. It's often co-located now uh, with the antennas. It doesn't require the same level of manual uh, maintenance and adjustment. Oftentimes when you're out at the sites, you're replacing gear that has failed or that needs a major upgrade to uh, handle the next level of performance. And our view of the network now has, has changed to where it now resembles more of a computer network where function-specific hardware like that associated with routers and switches, this is now being turned into virtual machines that run on software and they run on standard uh, computing elements uh, in the network. From a measurement and a test uh, standpoint, uh, rather than having to uh, validate mostly the radio, now we find ourselves having to validate the radio optical interfaces that are present in parts of the networking components, and then electrical, high-speed digital interfaces that are part of both the network components and the mobile devices uh, themselves. Uh, these products that uh, companies like Keysight uh, produce, all of the transducers that acquire the information have been upgraded to handle higher performance levels, but then behind the transducers, inside the products, 
are incredible uh, data flows to manage that acquired information, to try to process it in sometimes a real-time fashion, and then to be able to draw the insight out of it in order to make uh, the measurements and communicate it to the user. And so the users of these products, while they are experts in their end product design, in their technologies, they cannot afford to be experts in the operation of the test equipment. And this gives rise to some of that feedback that I shared a few minutes ago about the need for these solutions to deliver more turnkey results. Now, when we look at the um, future of hardware and how this moves over time, there will be continued changes. We can look to some of the terminology, some of the acronyms that we use uh, to provide some clues. So I'm thinking of words like the software-defined radio, self-organizing network, a cloud-based uh, RAN. These all speak to the idea that while the radios will always be present, as long as we're literally speaking about a wireless, the fact is more and more of the functionality is going to be taken on by digital elements in the system and then by software uh, that continues to add the functionality uh, to the system. Out on the air interface side, as Matt had indicated, uh, we see uh, MIMO, uh, we see multi-element antenna arrays, particularly in the dense uh, metropolitan environments. There will be both more uh, in number and a wider variety of objects that we could think of as base stations of different types to enable the connectivity uh, to the network. And then on the device side, um, it's harder to predict, I believe, but we do know there will be uh, more devices, probably of a wider variety of types as well. I think there will be devices that look more general purpose, uh, somewhat like the handheld products that we have today have evolved into, where they're really mobile computing platforms. But then there will be also devices that are more specialized and that are embedded into other objects, such that we may not even think of them as being uh, mobile devices. Of course, this gets then into that Internet of Things uh, part of the model. So uh, that's how the hardware moves. In terms of the measurement side, uh, for com companies like Keysight, uh, we see a number of things happening. Uh, one of them is, of course, the need for higher performance measurements. Frequency ranges that span from uh, tens of megahertz all the way up to 100 gigahertz and beyond. Uh, products that have the ability to accommodate tens or even thousands of simultaneous uh, radio channels. And then uh, beyond the transducers, uh, still more development in high-speed data flows of very high-performance computer systems in their own rights inside the test and measurement products to manage all of the data flow and to help process it and make sense of it uh, for the user. Beyond the raw specs, we see a need for more flexible solution architectures among test and measurement products. Again, to support that distributed use model that I mentioned. So sometimes the gear will have to be aggregated and put in service of a very focused uh, measurement. Other times it will have to be distributed in doing that sensor fusion model of integrating the information, coordinating the overall findings, and then trying to make sense of 